Well, good evening, everyone, on this chilly May evening. Uh, I'm Mark Nykirk, the director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at Northern Kentucky University. We are the host of the Six at Six lecture series, and tonight's lecture is the ninth in 10 this season. Uh, we're a little compressed for the next one, so uh, usually we're once a month, but in May we're doing two. So uh, tune in again next to uh, Tuesday night, same time, six o'clock uh, for our final lecture of the season. We're coming to you live from uh, the Southgate Street School in Newport, Kentucky, where we have been all season as we've tried to focus on uh, black uh, uh, history and culture. Uh, and that, that's uh, all of our uh, talks this season have been around that uh, uh, special topic. And this is the perfect place to be for that uh, topic. This school was for just over 80 years, the school for black kids in Campbell County. Uh, an amazing and inspirational place. The school started uh, immediately after the Civil War when the community said, uh, we need to do this and do so at a time where uh, educating the sons and daughters of slaves and freed blacks was an exceptional thing in the South. Uh, but here in Newport, the decision was made by the community that we will have a school. It stayed open here until right after uh, the uh, Brown versus Board of Education in uh, the mid 1950s, uh, when the schools were desegregated and the students from here moved into the general public uh, school system uh, quickly. And you think about that uh, elsewhere in America, we were still fighting school desegregation really into the 1970s, but here uh, the community said, let's do something uh, different. Uh, so here we are within uh, uh, two or three blocks of the Ohio River, the demarcation between uh, free states and slave states uh, in this special place where uh, children were told uh, that regardless of the color of their skin, an education uh, would allow them to be whatever they may dream to be. So we are uh, delighted to be here and thankful to the city of Newport for allowing us to broadcast from here. Uh, Scott Clark, who is the historic preservation officer for Newport is usually with us. He is in transit from Washington DC this uh, evening. So we say hello and safe travels to Scott and thanks for uh, uh, working with us uh, this season uh, to deliver this series of lectures. Also want to say thank you to our partners, our special partners this uh, uh, season, which have included the Holocaust and Humanity Center uh, in uh, Cincinnati. If you, uh, you can't, uh, uh, they're starting actually to, to have visitors again. So if you haven't been there, it opened in 2019. And then of course, a difficult year this past year, but a, a remarkable uh, uh, museum that celebrates the notion of being an upstander that is, uh, what is the uh, challenge in your times and can you stand up and be a champion of, uh, of that cause? Uh, the Northern Kentucky uh, um, uh, Forum is also our partner. Uh, and I, I urge you to look at the nkyforum.org site. Uh, uh, it is a group uh, and our center is a part of it along with the public libraries to bring dialogues about public issues in our community. And we have a very interesting one coming up Thursday at 6.30 uh, on uh, uh, the director of OKI will be speaking to us about uh, what's the transportation future look like as we have self-driving cars. So have a little fun and a few facts on Thursday night. So I hope you can be with us. Thomas More University is our uh, partner uh, this uh, uh, season also, as is the Northern Kentucky History uh, Tour, which is associated with uh, History Hour, which is associated with the Barron's Crawford Museum. So thank you to all of our partners. Normally with Six at Six, we move around to different venues uh, in the community uh, to be physically present at uh, the Barringer Crawford, the Carnegie, uh, the Mercantile Library in downtown Cincinnati, Campbell County Public Library, uh, and also on campus at NKU. But we've been here for this virtual season and thank you for uh, being uh, with us. Uh, and uh, please uh, mark your calendar uh, for next uh, uh, Tuesday, uh, Brandon Winford, who is a professor at the University of Tennessee, uh, we'll be talking about black business activities in the mid 20th century around civil rights. So we look at the civil rights movement often through um, a social justice lens, which is uh, as we should, but uh, 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 Dr. Winford's uh, research also looks at uh, how the business community rallied to this cause. Uh, and he is, uh, in case you're wondering why we have a, a University of Tennessee uh, professor, he is a published author with the University Press of Kentucky, which 
uh, is a consortium press in the state and NKU is a member of that. So uh, we look forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Uh, Winford. Uh, I wanna say a quick thank you to uh, a couple of people that you uh, don't see, but who are invaluable to us. Uh, uh, Riley Earhart is a uh, public history intern, a graduate student at NKU and an intern here at the Southgate Street School. And uh, he's uh, uh, helped us all evening to get set up. So thank you, Riley. And also Jordan Bourget, uh, who is, uh, Barget, who is uh, uh, with uh, North Media. North Media is a, uh, a co-curricular activity at NKU where students who are in electronic media broadcast uh, get to learn and hone their skills. And this season, they've been able to uh, uh, learn about Zoom production and uh, we're getting them, we hope, uh, job ready uh, right after graduation to move into that because there's a lot of Zoom production going on right now. So thank you, Riley. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I appreciate you all being with us and providing the support. Uh, tonight's talk on Frederick Douglass in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky is uh, presented by Professor um, Bob Wallace, uh, Regents Professor of English at uh, NKU. He is, uh, the semester is uh, wrapping up right now and uh, uh, Dr. Wallace has been teaching a, a course on Emily uh, Dickinson. He is uh, 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 also well known in the country really and perhaps in the world as a Moby Dick scholar. Uh, he's been with us in six at six before on that topic. But for the past 10 years, he's been working on a book on Frederick Douglass uh, in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. And uh, it's um, the book is uh, uh, in production, moving toward uh, production phase right now. So you can't buy it. I wish I could plug it and say, go purchase it right now. But just make note of, uh, that it's, it's coming and you're going to get a foretaste of what, a, uh, uh, what the research and story will be in that book. So uh, we'll have time for questions afterwards. So please put those in the Q&A. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks for being with us. And Bob, let's start. Thanks, Mark. It's an honor to be part of this great series you've had all year. It's always an honor to talk about Frederick Douglass and especially here at the Southgate Street School in Newport. So um, I will move the slide ahead here. And uh, Douglas visited Cincinnati five times between 1850 and 56. These visits were essential to his growth as an author, editor, orator, political activist, and multicultural community builder. Yet they've been essentially ignored by most Douglas scholars and Cincinnati historians. Recently, I found new evidence of the importance of anti, the anti-slavery movement in Northern Kentucky to Douglas uh, in 1856. And I will come to that toward the end of the talk. Uh, my overall takeaway from the research I've been doing on this subject over years is the courage and faith of the few true abolitionists in the 1850s. Um, Douglas, of course, speaks increasingly to us today after the George Floyd trial the Black Lives Matter movement, and more recently, the proposal to make the District of Columbia a state named for Douglas. I hope that happens. Uh, one truth he uttered in 1857 remains as strong as ever. That is that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. I'll return to that uh, later. Are we moving ahead here? Were we okay so far? Yeah. Okay. So uh, here's the itinerary of his visits uh, in the 1850s. Um, Douglas avoided Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky in October of 43. Uh, he was gonna come in 49, had to cancel. He finally did come in July of 1850. He returned in April of 52, again in April of 54. He made his fourth visit in uh, November of 54. He came again in March of 56. And at the end, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about four visits he made here uh, after the Civil War. So uh, Douglas escaped from Maryland as a fugitive slave in 1838. He settled in New Bedford. He moved to Boston in 1841 to work for uh, William Lloyd Garrison's anti-slavery organization. In 43, he toured the Western states with fellow Garrisonians. 
He was scheduled to speak uh, here in Cincinnati in October, but he was nearly murdered by a mob in Pendleton near Indianapolis. He was still a fugitive slave and his colleagues convinced him it'd be too dangerous to speak across the river from a slave state. So Douglas spoke in central Ohio while his colleagues spoke here. He later regretted that he had lacked the courage to come to Cincinnati. Uh, in 1845, he published his narrative of Frederick Douglass. And after that, he lectured in Great Britain for two years where friends purchased his freedom. When he returned to the States, Garrison blocked him from publishing his North Star newspaper in Cleveland. That's a prospectus for that paper on the left. Uh, so he took it to Rochester. From Rochester, he covered the Western states intensely until the Civil War. He felt that the Western states would ultimately determine the fate of the slavery issue. He had planned to make that first visit to Cincinnati in uh, July of 49, but he caught a fever on a lecture tour from Detroit just when the cholera was breaking out here and he had to cancel his visit. That was the ep epidemic that took the life of Harriet Beecher Stowe's infant son, Charlie, and she moved her family to New England a few months before he finally arrived in 1850. So he finally got here on July 4th, 1850. Um, he and his fellow Garrisonians had been driven out of New York City by a mob in May of that year. They could not return to New York City for three years. Um, in addition to being driven out of the lecture hall, Douglas and two white women had been physically assaulted for walking together in public in New York. So Cincinnati was truly a sanctuary city for him in 1850. Here he gave eight talks in seven days and began networking with both black and white Cincinnatians, many of whom he had already written about in his North Star newspaper. The city and the photographer of this powerful daguerreotype are unknown. So he arrived on the Little Miami Railroad over today's bike trail. He loved the beauty of the forests and the patriotism of the villagers he saw celebrating the 4th of July. The next day he wrote though, I could almost have joined them were this not a common hunting ground for men. And that's for fugitive slaves who were streaming over from Northern Kentucky. It was two years later in Rochester that he gave his famous speech what to the slave of the, is of the 4th of July? And his answer to that, both uh, from his arrival in Cincinnati and his lecture two years later, it's a, see, a deceit and a sham to talk about independence for enslaved Americans. Uh, on this visit in 1850, uh, the next day after he arrived, he spoke twice in College Hall. That was part of Cincinnati College, which later became UC. That building was at 4th and Walnut, where the Mercantile Library is today. Uh, there were Kentucky slaveholders in the audience who tried to disrupt this afternoon lecture. Uh, but as Douglas wrote, the Ohio Buckeyes in the audience threatened them into silence, unlike what had happened in New York recently. His eight talks that week concluded with a gala farewell at Baker Street Baptist, a black church near 3rd and Walnut. So he published four essays about just this one visit in Cincinnati. He wrote two letters from the editor from Cincinnati. They were published side by side, as you see on the left, in his North Star on July 15th. He also wrote a letter on the colored citizens of Cincinnati while he was in Columbus on the way home. In Columbus, he was attacked by a mob after speaking in the State House. Back home in Rochester, he wrote a comprehensive essay on our Western anti-slavery tour. But the, issue, the issues of the North Star from which those last two essays appeared no longer exist. Fortunately, each one was reprinted by the anti-slavery bugle in Salem, Ohio. And these reprints have been essential to my research on this project. So he came as the featured speaker of a three-day anti-slavery convention in Cincinnati in April of 52. He gave four major talks in three days. He participated in all the discussions. He helped to write all the resolutions that were passed. This anti-slavery convention repudiated the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. 
advocated political action to abolish slavery, something that Garrison opposed, and argued for the responsibility of Christian churches to oppose slavery, which few did at that time. In his essay called Jaunt to Cincinnati, he wrote that he was thrilled by the warm facts of history as they came glowing from brave hearts all around me. The conference that year was at Smith and Nixon Hall at the corner of Fourth and Vine. This was a brand new concert hall next to the Gazette newspaper printing house. It seated 1500 people. More than 800 were turned away on each of the last two evenings when Douglas spoke. The Daily Gazette covered the entire convention session by session all three days and Douglas reprinted its coverage verbatim in his paper. That helped uh, Cincinnati anti-slavery to get more widely known. In August, Douglas and three activists from that Cincinnati convention were major players at the National Convention of the Free Democratic Party in Pittsburgh. The other three were William Brisbane and Samuel Lewis from Cincinnati and George W. Julian from Indiana. Douglas was the secretary of the convention and this was his baptism into direct political action. He endorsed the party's presidential ticket in his paper and campaigned for them in the fall. Two years later, uh, Douglas and Lucy Stone were featured speakers at the April 54 convention in Cincinnati. He was now a political activist and Stone was still a Garrisonian who believed only in moral suasion. They differed in strategy, but they were equally passionate and eloquent. All voices at that convention joined in repudiating the newly passed Kansas-Nebraska Act. This was uh, generally held to be the most electrifying convention on any subject the city had ever seen. This year's convention was in Greenwood Hall on the third floor of this building at Sixth and Vine. Uh, that hall held 1,500 people, and on the last night, another 1,500 were turned away when Douglas and Stone were speaking together. There was a 23-foot wide map over the podium which showed the, free, the slave states in black and the free states in white with Kansas and Nebraska in gray and up for grabs. This annual Cincinnati convention had become one of the few in the country where all factions of the very fractious anti-slavery movement could be freely heard. So he stayed in Cincinnati for a week or more after this conference to uh, network with the black community in Cincinnati. And here is the uh, front page from his May 18, uh, 54 issue, and it's the first time he ever had an engraving in his newspaper, and the engraving is of J.P. Ball's Great Daguerrean Gallery of the West. Uh, Ball was a black photographer in Cincinnati, and uh, Douglas had uh, met him earlier, um, and this year he spent time and really got to know the operation there. He also um, gave a lecture on black self-help at Zion Baptist Church, and he published another highly appreciative essay about the colored people of Cincinnati. His journalistic praise of black Cincinnatians had begun in 1848 with three very detailed letters for, uh, from Cincinnati written by his co-editor, Martin Delaney. So two years after this, he returned to Cincinnati in March of 56 in the wake of the Margaret Garner trial. Um, this talk was four days after Garner and her family were sent back to slavery in Kentucky. She was the fugitive slave from Richwood, Kentucky, who killed her infant daughter to save her from a lifetime of slavery after they were captured on the Cincinnati side of the river. Douglas called Margaret the heroic slave mother. He colored, covered her trial, conviction, and the long aftermath continuously in his paper for five months, hoping her desperate act would help the newly forming National Republican Party oppose slavery in the South, as well as in Kansas and Nebraska. This is an 1856 photo of Douglas, whose city and photographer are currently unknown. 
So now I'm going to talk briefly about four white appearing Cincinnati abolitionists who had enabled and enriched these visits Douglas made in the 50s. Sarah Orust Ernst, William Henry Brisbane, Henry Blackwell, and Lucy Stone. I have found no photo of Sarah Ernst. This is her mother in 1809, uh, the year Sarah was born, painted by Gilbert Stewart, the guy who painted uh, President Washington so many times. Um, this was in Boston where she was born. She grew up as a Garrisonian abolitionist. But in 1841, she married Andrew Ernst, a Cincinnati horticulturalist. And she moved to his Spring Garden estate here in Cincinnati on a hillside above Mill Creek. In 43, she founded the Ladies Anti-Slavery Sewing Society to make clothing for the fugitives who came through the city. By 49, she was the mother of several children. She decided she also wanted to awaken Cincinnati to the sin of slavery itself. So she held an anti-slavery bazaar and raised enough money to sponsor Douglas's first visit in 1850. Her sewing society then sponsored five consecutive three-day anti-slavery conventions. These conventions made Cincinnati a national center of anti-slavery enlightenment. The featured speakers were Samuel Ringgold Ward in 51, Douglas in 52, William Lloyd Garrison in 53, Douglas and Stone in 54, and William Wells Brown in 55. In Cincinnati, she became known at this time as the Alpha and Omega of Cincinnati anti-slavery, although she is not generally remembered as such today. This was the Spring Garden Nursery in uh, two years before she came here, uh, overlooking uh, Harrison Pike and Mill Creek. Um, it's the site of the Western Hills Viaduct today. Uh, Andrew Ernst was then thought of as the pioneering horticulturalist in the West. In 1843, he was growing over 100 varieties of both apples and pears on this hillside. Uh, this is a lithograph of uh, the Spring Garden uh, nursery and estate in 1850, the year that Douglas arrived. And uh, when he was in town, the Ernst had a reception for him where he met the leading black and white abolitionists of the city. In the essay on our Western anti-slavery tour, he wrote after getting back in Rochester, he recalled uh, five individuals besides the Ernst themselves. Those were William Brisbane, Levi Coffin, John Gaines, William Watson, and William Casey. I'll be talking about most of them uh, later in this talk. So the only evidence we have at all that this uh, reception even occurred was uh, in the essay intended for the North Star that we only have today in the reprint from the Anti-Slavery Bugle. After describing uh, the beautiful grounds the Ernst had, uh, he went on to describe the, uh, the, the visit uh, with uh, Cincinnatians. And uh, after mentioning those five people whose names I've just given, he wrote, in company with such a band, days were but hours and hours but minutes. You can imagine how it was being received by Cincinnatians in this way so soon after being run out of New York City. So this is the way Cincinnati appears today from the hillside uh, right behind where Spring Garden used to be. There's still an Ernst Street there, by the way. So this is a painting that Robert Duncanson did of Ernst in the 50s that has since been lost. Uh, this is a photograph that a colleague of mine found in uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society. And it's a black and white photo of this painting that um, after uh, Ernst died in 1860, the painting went to the Mercantile Library. And around 1905, uh, nobody knew much about who Ernst was and the Duncanson revival had not begun yet. Um, so the library gave this painting to the Colored Orphans Asylum from which it has disappeared. We don't know where it is. Hopefully it's in some huge, um, barn or attic now, which uh, sometimes happens with these old paintings. Um, 
After he died, Sarah moved with her five children to Boston. Um, but before her death in 1882, she arranged for her remains to be sent back to Cincinnati. And uh, you see the markers there in Spring Grove Cemetery where she now is with uh, her husband again. Trying to move the slide, there we go. Um, our next Cincinnatian is in the center of this picture, William Brisbane. This was a triple daguerreotype taken by J.P. Ball in 1853. To our right is Levi Coffin, who looks much younger in this image than in any other that we have. And to our left is Brisbane's uh, right-hand man, uh, Andrew Harwood. Um, Coffin was widely acknowledged as the president of the Underground Railroad here, and Brisbane and Harwood were his board of managers. They were both very much involved in all of the operations. Brisbane was born to a slaveholding family in South Carolina. He was trained as a medical doctor, then as a Baptist preacher, uh, but he decided slavery was wrong. He sold his slaves and moved to Cincinnati in 38 as the pastor of the First Baptist Church. He lived in this house uh, in uh, Cheviot near Hamilton Pike, uh, just over the hill from the Ernst. Um, he was soon dismissed from the First Baptist Church for his anti-slavery views. And after coming here, he had decided to repurchase those slaves he had sold in South Carolina. He emancipated them and brought them here to Cincinnati. He was a leading Cincinnati abolitionist until 1853 when he moved his family to Wisconsin. During this time, he was a Liberty Party politician who preached in black Baptist churches. He wrote anti-slavery treatises and novels. He published an anti-slavery paper and he founded anti-slavery action committees. What's really been helpful to my project is he kept a daily journal uh, during his 15 years in Cincinnati, which is now up at the Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, from this, you come to see in great detail that he was Sarah Ernst's right-hand man in running those first three anti-slavery conventions. She was a Garrisonian. He was a political activist, uh, but they collaborated in setting the tone by which all sides of the movement would be heard. Brisbane was a leader in the transition from the Free Democratic Party in 1852 to the National Republican Party four years later. Douglas covered Brisbane's political, literary, and religious activity in his newspaper. Uh, like Sarah Ernst, he was a hero of Cincinnati anti-slavery who is hardly known today. Uh, the little bit of his diary I show there at the lower left uh, eight, February 22nd, 1849, he's um, recording that his friend Salmon P. Chase has just been elected uh, the U.S. Senator from Ohio. So in 52, on the night before the Cincinnati Convention, Brisbane met Frederick Douglass here in the Dumas house on the left in this photo. That was the only hotel at which Blacks could stay in the city. There they drafted all the resolutions that would be presented the next three days. And many of those same resolutions were adopted by the Free Democratic Party at the National Convention in Pittsburgh that August. So my next Cincinnatian is Henry Blackwell. He was a young hardware merchant who spoke very eloquently at the 1852 convention. The next year he fell in love with Lucy Stone at a conference in Boston. He organized a Western tour for her that began in Cincinnati in October of 53. In 54, he took Brisbane's place in organizing uh, the convention along with um, Sarah Ernst. Uh, in 55, he married Lucy Stone and they had the first prenuptial agreement in the nation, which was widely um, distributed through many national papers. Uh, Lucy moved into the Blackwell family home in Walnut Hills. They lived here for a time until they moved on later to Wisconsin and North New Jersey. So this is Lucy Stone, born in Massachusetts. She was the first woman to graduate from Oberlin 
in 47. She gave both anti-slavery and women's rights lectures in Cincinnati in October of 53. Uh, and that's when JP Ball took this locket photo of her, which, is, which I found in the Library of Congress. Uh, she and Douglas were featured speakers in the 54 convention, as I mentioned, and she married Blackwell in 55. She famously defended Margaret Garner during the Cincinnati court case in 56, which we'll come back to. So uh, here is a, just a quick summary of that, that she interviewed Garner in the jail and uh, assured her that a thousand hearts were beating with hers during this very long and torturous trial. Um, in the courtroom, she defended Garner's right to send her own child to heaven rather than back to slavery. And Douglas featured Stone's testimony as well as Gar the Garner trial very prominently in his paper. So now I'll turn quickly to four black appearing Cincinnati abolitionists who enabled and enriched Douglas's visits in the 50s. John Gaines, William Watson, J.P. Ball, and Peter Clark. In 1841, Gaines was only 20 years old when he emerged as an orator protesting the vicious anti-black riots in Cincinnati that year. In 48, he became an agent for Douglas's North Star in Cincinnati. The next year, he helped repeal Ohio's black laws. In 1850, he helped to welcome Douglas at the Spring Garden reception. And he gave a major address at that gala farewell at Baker Street Baptist for Douglas. In 53, he attended Douglas's National Colored Convention in Rochester. In 54, he arranged Douglas's self-help address at Zion Baptist. And throughout the 1850s, he was a regular contributor to Frederick Douglass's paper, including a little known account of Margaret Garner in the Cincinnati courtroom, which he called description of the noble heroine. He considered her to be noble because she cut her child's throat from ear to ear rather than see it returned to bondage. Our next uh, Cincinnatian is William W. Watson. I've found no known photo of him so far. He was a black barber and bathhouse operator and entrepreneur. Uh, he was a trustee of Baker Street Baptist Church. He collaborated with Brisbane in the early 1840s when Brisbane's First Baptist Church sold its Baker Street building to Watson's Union Baptist Church, which then became known as Baker Street Baptist. Uh, Watson also became a local agent of the North Star in 48. He stayed in Douglas's home in Rochester that year when he helped to officiate at the Emancipation Day ceremonies there. Watson helped to welcome Douglas at Spring Garden in 1850. He coordinated his Baker Street events that year, and he was praised by Douglas in several essays throughout the 50s. He was also praised by Harriet Beecher Stowe in the last chapter of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, there he's represented by the initial W followed by some dashes. And there he's described as a three fourths black barber from Kentucky, 19 years free, paid for self and family over $3,000 worth over $20,000. So now if you read that last chapter, you'll know who W is. So my next Cincinnatian is J.P. Ball, the now famous black daguerreotypist. Uh, Douglas first praised him in the North Star in 1850 when he visited a, a relatively small uh, photographic studio on Fifth Street. Uh, and then he did the big front page feature in 54 when Ball had moved into really wonderful um, studio on Fourth Street in Cincinnati. Uh, Ball photographed many Cincinnati, Cincinnati abolitionists, including Andrew Ernst, William Brisbane, Edward Harwood, Levi Coffin, Henry Blackwell, and Lucy Stone. And most of these photos have only been recently attributed to him during my work on this project. His only known photo of Douglas was after the Civil War, when Douglas returned in 67. Ball probably did photograph him in the 1850s, in a photo, in photos that are either no longer existing or not yet attributed to him. 
That front page image of Balls de Guerin Gallery of the West in 54 was accompanied by an article also praising Robert Duncanson, whose paintings were being exhibited in Ball's gallery then. Douglas played a major role in making both Ball and Duncanson known nationally. This uh, catalog on the left was for Ball's mammoth anti-slavery panorama in 55. Uh, this was exhibited in Greenwood Hall uh, one year after the convention with Douglas and Stone. It was a 2,400 square foot campus, canvas on two spindles that took two hours to unroll before an audience. Its imagery was painted by black painters here, probably supervised by Duncanson, who was then working directly for Ball's gallery. The panorama was then shown in Boston and Providence, Rhode Island before disappearing from sight. We're hoping it might still be in a barn in New England somewhere because actually those old panoramas have been showing up occasionally. That catalog on the left is all we have right now, but it's a lot. Its description of every image follows the horrors of slavery from the coast of Africa to Charleston and New Orleans, then up the Mississippi and Ohio rivers through Cincinnati and the Northern states to freedom in Canada. My fourth Cincinnatian is Peter Clark. He was a nephew of John Gaines. In 53, he accompanied James to the Gaines to the Colored National Convention in Rochester, where he served as secretary. He was active in the 54 convention here, featuring Douglas and Stone, and also in the Black Self-Help meeting a week later at Zion Baptist. Uh, in 55, Clark published his own paper, the Cincinnati Herald of Freedom, for our black community here, but it died shortly for lack of support. In 56, he moved to Rochester as the assistant editor of Douglas's paper and ran that paper whenever Douglas was on tour. Like his uncle John Gaines, Clark became a leading Cincinnati educator, serving for 20 years as principal of Gaines High School. So you can see from what we've gone through so far that Douglas was very well known as an orator, author, editor, and political activist in Cincinnati in the 1850s. He was also very well known for the networking he was doing within both the black and white communities in person, as well as in his paper, all of which began at the reception at Spring Garden in 1850. So now we're gonna to turn to Douglas and Northern Kentucky in 1856. We'll start with the Garner infanticide take a look at Salmon P. Chase as governor of Ohio, a look at Douglas and Garner during the 1856 election, and finally a look at W.S. Bailey's Newport newspaper. So Garner's infanticide um, was a huge event in, in 56. And before saying that, I wanna say that the anti-slavery movement in Northern Kentucky was primarily in the hearts, minds, and bodies of those who were enslaved. They moved um, by crossing the river to freedom or in other ways. And Garner was not the first to take the life of her child. In 48, uh, Delaney wrote those three letters in Douglas's paper. In one of them, he talked about this enslaved family from Grant County in Northern Kentucky. They were uh, purchased by a slave trader named Rust who put them in the Covington jail overnight before he sent them south. Uh, they heard overnight that they were gonna be separated from their infant child in the morning and that child be left here with no one to protect her. So the mother killed the child, the father killed the mother. He tried to kill himself with the pen knife they were using. Um, and uh, this was a very highly covered event in 48 and Delaney, treated them as heroes for uh, being true to themselves in this very tough and difficult way. He thought their name should be known forever the way uh, Romans were being honored in our schools at the time. Uh, we don't know their names yet right now. I've spent time in the Covenant City archives trying to find out and uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, official record that says who these people were. Well, in 56, eight years later, 
Uh, the Garners escaped from adjacent farms in Richwood. Um, and uh, she was with the Gaines family. Her husband, Robert, was with the nearby uh, Marshall family. Uh, all eight of them got into a sleigh. Uh, there are four children, Margaret and Robert, and Robert's parents. Uh, they took that uh, over icy roads, 18 miles to Covington, uh, 16 miles to Covington, um, over essentially what is now the Dixie Highway. Uh, they left the sleigh and crossed the river at night, and, but they were captured in Cincinnati in the morning. As soon as she saw they would be captured, uh, Margaret tried to kill all her children and did kill her first one before she was stopped. During the one month trial, abolitionists in Ohio tried to keep her on the Ohio side of the river to be tried for murder, but instead she was convicted by the federal laws under the Fugitive Slave Act and returned to her owner in Kentucky. It would have been possible to bring her back to Ohio for the Ohio trial and Governor Chase requested this from the governor of Kentucky, but he was very slow in making this request. And the day before the request finally got to Frankfurt, um, Gaines had the family on a boat from Louisville down to Arkansas. Um, it's interesting that the governor, Governor Morehouse of Kentucky did follow through with that. And he found Margaret in Arkansas and brought her back to Covington for the Ohio uh, authorities to uh, get her for the trial over there. But Chase was again, a little late in claiming her, uh, Gaines managed to remove her from jail shortly before the Ohio authorities arrived. And this time he sent her to Louisiana from which she never returned. Uh, all of this took a long time to play out. It was very painful. So Douglas covered this case very intensely in his paper. And for a long time, I couldn't find out whether he did or not because uh, Douglas's paper is almost inaccessible from 56. If you study the paper today, there's a great database, Accessible Archives, that covers his whole paper from 47 until uh, 55 and has a great little keyword search. You can key in uh, Covington, Cincinnati, and find how thoroughly he was covering our, covering our area all that time. But uh, copies from 56 are very scarce. There's no archive in the country that has a no library where you can look at any large number of issues from that. Fortunately, the uh, Frederick Douglass papers are being um, edited in Indianapolis at IUPUI. And they have pulled together a microfilm from, that has uh, his newspaper in 56 from seven different, so six, yeah, seven different sources. And there on that microfilm, I was able to follow all the way through uh, what he was covering about the trial. And I was amazed. He had, uh, in his weekly paper, he had two to four stories every week from January through April of the trial itself and that long aftermath. So he covered the escape, the capture, detailed accounts of testimony by witnesses, arguments by lawyers. He published exclusive accounts, accounts of the trial by Gaines and other Cincinnati correspondents. The accounts by Lucy Stone and others who visited Garner in jail. The attacks on uh, the protests out in the street. The painful return on the ferry of the family to Covington. Attacks on reporters that were made in Covington. And the heroic nature of the Garner attorney, John Jolliffe. Um, also published poetry supporting Garner and the action and inaction of Governor Chase during this whole period. All of uh, Douglas's coverage stressed the courage of Garner for saving her child from a life of slavery. Um, along the way, Douglas published two letters from John Jolliffe in response to support he'd gotten from Gaines and other black Cincinnatians. And in one of those letters, uh, Jolliffe said to them, Someday Kentucky will be proud to be the birthplace of the Garners, my unfortunate clients. It's taken quite a while for that to happen, but to some degree it is true. So um, now we're gonna look at the creation of the National Republican Party and go back a while in time. That's Salmon P. Chase 
the bust of him at the Mercantile Library in Cincinnati today. In the 40s, uh, Chase was uh, very active in Cincinnati anti-slavery. He was a heroic defender of those fugitives who escaped to Cincinnati from Northern Kentucky. Uh, he was a colleague of Brisbane, Samuel Lewis and others in the Liberal Party of Cincinnati. And as I mentioned, he was elected US Senator from Ohio in 49. There in the Senate, he attacked the Fugitive Slave Bill and the Kansas-Nebraska Act, but he did not join the Free Democrats in 52. In November of 54, uh, Douglas came back to Cincinnati uh, after that April convention, and he lectured on the anti-slavery movement. And this was right after uh, great victories in the Western states by the newly formed state Republican party. There was no national party yet. Um, and those parties had very much grown out of the free democratic movement in 52. Uh, Douglas drew a direct line from the Free Soil Party of 48 through the Free Democratic Party of 52 to the new state Republican parties now being formed. But he lamented that these state Republican parties are not abolitionists. They're only wanting to keep slavery out of the new Western territories of Kansas and Nebraska. And that then was Chase's position, uh, worried about Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, because of the way this was shaping up, in the summer of 55, Douglas and others from the uh, formed the Radical Abolitionist Party to oppose slavery in the South and to pressure newly mobilized Republicans to do the same. Later that year, Chase was elected as the first Republican governor of Ohio, and in doing so, he had pledged not to touch slavery in the South. So uh, during the Garner trial, and its aftermath, Douglas and many others were really disappointed that a Republican governor had been able to do so little to uh, defend either the, Gar the Garners or what they considered the honor of the state of Ohio, the way that uh, the trial itself and the aftermath played out. So now uh, Garner and Douglas during the 1856 election. In February of, of uh, 22nd of 56, the, Republic, the representatives from those different Republican parties met in Pittsburgh to lay the groundwork to form a national party. That was uh, one week before the verdict was delivered in the Garner case. After speaking uh, in Cincinnati on March 3rd, Douglas then covered the aftermath of the Garner trial and the formation of the National Republican Party side by side in his paper. And he used the Garner case to draw the attention, attention to the inhumanity of slavery in the South and what he felt was the need of the new party to address it. In May, he attended the convention of the Radical Abolitionist Party. And as expected, he endorsed its presidential candidate, Garrett Smith. But he still had some hopes for the new Republican Party and its platform. In June, he followed very closely the Republican Party nominating convention in Philadelphia and he was moderately pleased with the strength of its anti-slavery platform and its nomination of John Fremont. In August, he surprised many of his followers by endorsing Fremont and the Republican Party in his paper. And he later went to Wisconsin and Chicago to vigorously campaign. Now, Fremont lost to Buchanan, the Democrat, in the November election, but Douglas was deeply encouraged by what the Republican Party had achieved in such a short time. He spent the most, most of the rest of his long life trying to reform the Republican Party, first um, from outside, but soon from inside the party. A year later in 57, he gave his famous West Indian Emancipation Address in which he said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Uh, he cited Margaret Garner taking the life of her infant child to save her from slavery as his first example of making the necessary demand to power. So now we'll turn to William S. Bailey, who's the editor of the Newport News here in Kentucky, uh, which was uh, at the time the only anti-slavery paper in any slave state. And uh, later in the 50s, uh, Bailey changed its name to the Free South. He was a gutsy guy. 
Uh, he was a machinist from Ohio who moved to Newport to establish his shop. He wrote some anti-slavery uh, essays for the Newport News and had a chance to acquire the paper in 1850 and made it a very strongly anti-slavery paper throughout the decade. Uh, his house and press were burned down in 1851 by uh, arsonists, and, but he persisted all the way through the decade. Again, even after his, uh, the mob threw his press into the Ohio River in 59, he again kept publishing. He was also very active nationally, politically. He was a, a delegate to uh, both the Radical Abolitionist Convention in 56 and the Republican National Convention. And Douglas featured Bailey in his paper again and again throughout the 50s and especially uh, after 56. And uh, in 58, I've got a few samples here. Uh, Douglas uh, published the report of the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, who had a long paragraph uh, praising Bailey, uh, saying that such a paper in a slave state deserves support. And Bailey, uh, Douglas helped Bailey and other abolitionists did to raise money from Northern states. That report also emphasized that Bailey's paper was a family operation, his wife and children uh, pretty much helped him in getting it out, which was pretty much the situation with Douglas's own paper by the uh, late 50s when it was hard to support an anti-slavery paper. In October of 58, Douglas reprinted this personal report Bailey made of the colored schools in Ohio uh, from the Free South newspaper. Bailey had traveled uh, to Xenia and other towns and was very impressed with how black students were being educated at the school in Xenia and also at Wilberforce University, the new black university. Douglas had spoken at uh, Wilberforce earlier that year. In December of that year, uh, Douglas reprinted a, a, an article called Slave Hunting in Ohio from the Free South. Uh, a jaunty account of blacks in Zanesville, Ohio, who armed themselves to protect seven Kentucky fugitives from the slave catchers who were after them. Uh, the article ended by asking, what is the difference between Ohio being a slave state and giving the slaveholder power to hunt down his slaves in the state? So in 1860, Bailey was again a delegate to both the radical abolitionist and Republican party conventions. He and Douglas and most of the Cincinnatians I've mentioned today were abolitionists all the way through the 1850s. Salmon Chase and Abraham Lincoln, like most mainstream Republicans, became abolitionists of necessity during the Civil War. So uh, I've got a little post-war epilogue here. Um, and after the Civil War, uh, Douglas lectured four times in Cincinnati between uh, 1867 and 69. His topics included the perils to the Republic and the assassination and its lessons. J.P. Ball took this photo of Douglas's triumphant lecture tour, a uh, lecture return uh, to a mixed race audience in Mozart Hall in January 57. And that was one week after the suspension bridge finally opened to traffic between Cincinnati and Covington. Douglas had first written about Roebling's plans for the suspension bridge in the North Star in 49. He'd been following that all those years. I expect that he soon crossed over that bridge into Northern Kentucky uh, into the land he had feared when he was a fugitive. In 76, he returned to Cincinnati as a delegate from the District of Columbia to the National Republican Convention here in Cincinnati. That was the one that nominated Rutherford B. Hayes as its presidential candidate. And Hayes had actually worked as a young lawyer in Cincinnati defending Margaret Garner and other fugitives uh, in the 50s. In 76, Douglas warned his party not to abandon the blacks in the South that the party had done so much to free. Interestingly, William Brisbane was still doing well in Wisconsin and he was an official delegate to the same Republican convention in Cincinnati. So it looks like I have time. I'm going to close with three short footnotes here. Um, going back to May of 1850, two weeks after surviving the attacks by the mob in New York City, 
Douglas wrote a letter to Senator Chase of Ohio. Chase had written this young black editor asking how Douglas felt about the probability of colored Americans remaining in this country. A lot of people uh, of both races wondered how this would play out. Douglas in answering acknowledged, <clears throat> quote, the causes likely to influence our destiny do not appear very favorable to our remaining here. Even so, he felt that there has been no time in history of our country when there were more favorable indications than are to be seen at this day. So Douglas somehow kept faith in the future of this country through all of the bitter challenges of the 1850s. And I see this letter as his personal pledge of allegiance to the nation he had hoped we would become. Here, uh, Douglas returned to Cincinnati in 1888. Uh, he came as the featured speaker of the 18th annual convention of the American Women's Suffrage Association that Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell had formed in 69. The Cincinnati Enquirer had been blatantly racist in its coverage of Douglas in the 1850s and again in 67, but it expressed genuine respect in 88. Here is what it wrote. With his almost flowing white hair, standing out in sharp contrast to the African hue of his skin. His strength of feature and power of physique added to his reputation for intellectual vigor combined to make up a personality that has no counterpart in any land. Contrast that with, what the, with the inquirer's deeply offensive characterization of the mixed race audience that welcomed Douglas to Mozart Hall in 1867. The headline, Amalgamation in the Ascendants, Mingling of Odor and Sentiment. It smells to the upper tier. Um, Douglas always had faith that people and newspapers could change. And this change in the Inquirer uh, when he returned very late in life was one very good example of that. I've got one more slide uh, going back to Lucy Stone. Uh, she died in 1893. They both been born the same year. Douglas gave a eulogy for her, declaring that no person had ever been so loyal to both racial justice and women's rights. Douglas died at the door of his Cedar Hill home in Washington uh, as he returned, this was in 95, two years later, as he returned from a meeting of the United National American Women's Rights Association. I will conclude this presentation with the headline that appeared the next day in the Cincinnati Enquirer. Gasped and fell back dying. Fred Douglas, the great colored statesman, suddenly expires in his home at Washington. He had just returned from the women's convention and was telling his wife what he had heard. Remarkable career of a slave who obtained fame that was worldwide. So I've enjoyed talking to some about Cincinnati and his uh, experience of our locality here. And I'd be happy to take any questions of this, if they've been coming in. We do have a, a few questions uh, uh, for you. Uh, one uh, 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 member of the audience asked, didn't Douglas give a keynote address in 1876 at the 1876 convention, the last event held at the Exposition Hall before it was torn down to make way for music hall. Yeah, that's the one I just mentioned, um, where he was afraid the party was going to cave into these really strong pressures that were coming from the South to roll back all the gains of, of the um, Reconstruction. And uh, he felt that was coming and he warned against it. It was actually not the keynote address. It was quite an informal speech. It was impromptu. They called him out of the audience when they saw him there. And that's what he said off the top of his head. So that was in the building that became um, Music Hall as we know it today. Uh, the next question, uh, and maybe you could uh, take a question a little further and just talk about uh, uh, where you had to uh, uh, go to find information and so forth, because I know you mentioned uh, some of the diaries uh, being in Wisconsin and so forth. But the question is, this is an excellent collection of information. Is there a collection of this information at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center? 
Um, they have scattered uh, things at the Freedom Center. Uh, they had one thing that was very helpful to my research. They currently have the minutes of the uh, Baker Street Baptist Church. That's how I found out that uh, Brisbane and, and Watson had collaborated in that move uh, where the black church took over Brisbane's white church. Uh, but when the Freedom Center was established, the original idea, they did not have a library or an archive. It was mainly to be a, a museum for people to come in and see things, but not for scholars to study in depth. They have some archival material there, but they're not rich in archives yet as a relatively new organization. And that had not been their game plan at the beginning. So most of what I've learned has been hit and miss from all over the place, actually. And uh, I think the, the most important single source is that uh, diary of Brisbane, which he was so connected with everyone. And it's also up in Wisconsin. Uh, he left there that triple daguerreotype by J.P. Ball, which is an incredible ball image. And nobody here in Cincinnati knew about it because it's been sitting up there in Wisconsin. So uh, there are um, scattered uh, things throughout Cincinnati uh, where you can learn about this history, but there's no uh, one place you can go to um, luxuriate in all this information. If I could kind of stay with this uh, uh, question, uh, 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 a few things. One, uh, what kind of drew you to this topic? And uh, also, uh, I think one of the conclusions that I'm drawing from listening to you is just how many ties Frederick Douglass had to Cincinnati. I wonder if you knew that when you started uh, or if that was uh, uh, one of the things the research uh, led you to. So how did you get involved in this in the first place? Uh, were the Cincinnati connections stronger than you thought? Uh, and maybe just what kind of surprised you in the research? That's a great question. I'll take a sip of water. So <clears throat> I got started in this because <clears throat> of our Melville project in New Bedford where we established the most uh, Melville Society cultural project in, in uh, 2000. And I, I, I got keenly interested in Douglas when I realized that he was living in New Bedford when Douglas came, when Melville went through and, and went whaling from there. So I started to look at, and I realized that Douglas was working on the waterfront when Melville was waiting for the ship to sail. And more than that, he was preaching in the black church that Melville mentions in chapter nine of Moby Dick. So uh, we started uh, in New Bedford with uh, research into Melville and Douglas in that city. And that led to um, the book I wrote on Douglas and Melville in 2005. And we had a big exhibition on the two of them in New Bedford. And then it was probably about five years later, I came across a little stray thing that suggested he may have been here. I'd never heard anything about Douglas being in Cincinnati. So I started to um, find out what I could. And there really were no sources that really dealt with this at all. In fact, th there's a great new biography by David Blight uh, that came out, I think a year or two ago, it's 900 pages long. It does not mention these visits to Cincinnati or his connections with any of these people. It's pretty much an unknown story for some reason. So we're so well known for the Underground Railroad, but we're not known as a center for anti-slavery enlightenment, which we really were. Uh, what Ernst and Brisbane did in, in the 50s was incredible and people then knew it, but it's just been lost from history. So uh, one thing that's very helpful, there was a book on Sarah Ernst that was uh, published about uh, 12 years ago um, that dealt with, it had a little chapter on her or fleeting references to her dealing with um, women abolitionists in the North. So that was the first place I found somebody who was starting to write about these five conventions that she had as if there was something important. But um, most of our history focuses on uh, the Underground Railroad and Levi Kaufman, Kaufman and everyone thinks of that when they, when they think of our history. So to flesh out what happened on the uh, Enlightenment side, uh, it took a lot of research, but then when I, fortunately we, we, we got accessible archives at NKU so I could search that database. So I started plugging in, I started teaching 
Douglas and Melville first, and then I then I started doing the research on Cincinnati. And you plug in Cincinnati and Covington in accessible archives, and you find hundreds of entries on Cincinnati and dozens on Covington. And you find this incredible thing that Delaney wrote in, in 48 about the family in, in the Covington jail. Um, and uh, so like every place you turn as you start getting into it, you find other connections. And <clears throat> I think one unfortunate thing about some of the general thought about Cincinnati history, you hear a lot of people say that the blacks and whites did not collaborate at all, the, the anti-slavery people. But um, Ernst and Blackwell and um, Brisbane and Douglas and Gaines and Watson, they were all collaborating. And you could see it in that first reception. So once I saw that reception, <clears throat> fortunately, you know, the, the anti-slavery bugle had reprinted that thing. I couldn't find the, the, the first two things in the North Star with those two letters Douglas wrote from Cincinnati in 1850 referred to more letters to come. And then I couldn't find anything. There were no more issues of the North Star. And three weeks later, when the North Star shows up again, they're over. So I wondered if maybe the anti-slavery bugle would cover it, and they did. So once I saw the reception at, um, you know, that had been given for him at the Ernst uh, Spring Garden and, and who was there, that, that made me know that there was a big subject that was truly multicultural. And that, that was, <clears throat> I think, maybe the most exciting thing about this. But I guess the other thing was to learn what an incredible networker Douglas was and how multicultural he was. Well, he's aware of that being uh, half white and half black. He was very uh, conscious of that. Um, and, and his goal was to unify this country. And this was a place where he got support in doing that. And he got support here all the way through the 50s, whereas Garrison turned viciously on him in 53 when he started interpreting the constitution differently. And uh, he um, was so courageous in following uh, what he felt was the right way to go and to trying to build a true national coalition. And these people in Cincinnati were uh, central in encouraging him and modeling uh, what that could look like. So. Uh, that was all a big surprise. And I guess I'll say the other biggest surprise was to learn about this free democratic convention in 52, because usually historians talk about the free sale party in 48, and it screwed up because they chose a Martin, a Martin Van Buren who was not really anti-slavery and they, they lost their anti-slavery um, platform that year. He didn't even approve a, a platform. And, and so people assume that it, the movement died then. And then somewhere out of nowhere, the Republicans started having state parties in 54, Wisconsin, other states that finally led to the national party. Well, this, um, this free democratic party in 52 and their national convention in, in Pittsburgh was an absolute um, link between those two and a, a lifeline for that whole movement. And as Douglas said, when he spoke here in 54, he was in the center of that. So these people, Brisbane and Lewis and, um, and uh, George W. Julian from, from, Louis, from uh, Indiana who were here at that big convention in 52, they, they kept that going. And um, that's a big gap in our, in our American history. And when you think about that, the locals here, Brisbane, Lewis, and, and um, well, there's another surprise about Chase along the way, but Chase in, in the uh, early 40s, they were Liberty Party um, supporters of uh, William Burney, who had his paper here in, in uh, the 30s, the philanthropists, and Burney was the Liberty Party candidate in 40 and 44. So that's where the kind of pure abolitionist movement in the West started was those Cincinnatians. And then it's a straight line from them all the way through the free soil and then the free democratic and then the Republican. So that's why I'm, I'm, I was surprised to find what, what, what I would say, uh, I was surprised to find how deep are the abolitionist roots of the Republican party. 
and they go all the way back to Cincinnati in the 40s with these Liberty Party people. And there's just a straight line going all the way through, whereas usually there's a truncated line as people approach history as if the Republicans started from nowhere in 56, which was not true. So that's been pretty exciting to discover, but it's made my book longer, you know? So this is a problem when, uh, when a project keeps growing like this one did. Uh, I wonder if uh, you've been living in the uh, 19th century a little bit. Uh, yeah. We, uh, uh, we uh, our public discourse is, uh, you know, cable television and uh, social media and so forth, but you've taken into this, uh, in the world of uh, um, uh, multiple newspapers started by, uh, you know, started newspapers and, uh, uh, with positions and uh, conventions and uh, uh the form, for, formulation of new uh, political parties around causes. Uh, and um, so I wonder if you could just reflect, I mean, what take us into one of those conventions, these gatherings where you bring Frederick Douglass in, uh, 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 the Sewing Society for Freedom uh, 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 brings Frederick Douglass in to speak to at a hall. Uh, very different world, uh, but you used a phrase a moment ago about building coalitions. Mm -hmm. Uh, let us visit the 19th century for a moment through your eyes. Well, uh, one interesting thing was we had seven active newspapers at the time. And the Inquirer was the most racist by any terms. And, and others were along the spectrum with the, the Gazette, the most liberal for a good part of the 50s. But those papers shifted their alignments too. But uh, the, there was a lot of discourse. Um, and people... That when uh, Brisbane and Samuel Lewis were going through Ohio campaigning when Lewis was running for governor, um, Lewis would, uh, Brisbane would talk for an hour and then Lewis would talk for an hour and 45 minutes. And they did that because if Lewis went first, Brisbane would never get to speak. So people are sitting there in, 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 in a gubernatorial race in Ohio, listening for two and a half hours to these guys speak. You know, so of course we didn't have the kind of entertainment we had today, but there was a lot of intense interest among a limited number of the public. I mean, what is really surprising is how few true abolitionists there were in this whole period. These people were up against it. But when you look from their point of view in the 50s, there was no way they'd ever win. I mean, it, everything seemed stacked against them. And when you look at, you know, Brisbane, Douglas and Ernst, the faith they had to keep doing this was incredible. And it did take the coalition building. And um, you never knew when uh, somebody would, um, you know, make a breakthrough that made a difference. And one thing Douglas was very strong about was that Uncle Tom's Cabin made a huge difference because he felt that the, even when the, the um, even when people like Garrison and we're saying there's no hope in the government. Uh, you have to do it just through talking to people. Um, and, and he wouldn't take political action. And when the political action seemed blocked, uh, Douglas always felt he had faith in, in the American public. And if the word got out to them, they would come through and finally be humane. And when uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin was published, uh, he supported it very strongly. And also uh, Stowe supported him very strongly when Garrison was attacking him viciously. So they were coming from different sides of things because she was from the religious side of the abolition movement. He was most the political, but um, those abolitionists who were working for it were tireless and they just kept building uh, a coalition and, and her, um, her book had a huge influence in uh, certainly uh, striking up uh, real hatred for the Fugitive Slave Law, although it was never really repealed, uh, and for, um, you know, having a lot of fight uh, kickback against the um, Kansas-Nebraska Act. Both of those bills, in terms of public um, sentiment, backfired in a way, because the abolitionists were able to show the inhumanity of those laws. So it took everything. It, it took the newspapers who would help. It took the lecturers who would get there, who take the grassroots people who would get out there. Um, and a very small number of people 
made this happen. But it, it, I was really interested to learn how few people, even among the Republican Party, throughout the 50s were not abolitionists. They, they, they wouldn't touch slavery in the South. They thought it was, it was too, big, too big a thing to try to conquer. It's enough to try to keep them from messing up our Northern states by chasing their slaves on our territory and letting slavery out there. So, you know, Douglas and Ernst and Brisbane and our, uh, our guy here in um, Newport, they, these people are really standing alone and saying that we not only have to inoculate the North from slavery, we have to eliminate slavery. So I think uh, it is very encouraging in a way um, to see that at least in those times, uh, this incredible success was achieved. However, 10 years later, it all started slipping away. Right in, 50, in 76, when Hayes was elected and, and it was a tied election, it was brokered in Congress, and he had to agree to pull the federal troops out of the South in order to be elected and a, a very complicated situation. And from that time on, it all went backward until the civil rights movement almost a hundred years later. So it's kind of like we're seeing right now in the last decade, one step forward, two backward, maybe two ahead, a half back, and hopefully you can keep moving. And Douglas somehow, had the belief that, that we could keep moving forward eventually in spite of these incredible um, obstacles that were faced. So it is very encouraging uh, reading about him and about the others who kept the faith during the time. Bob, well, this is a, a, a short question. I'm not sure if it's a simple question, but uh, was John Gaines, who you mentioned, related to the Gaines family in which were wrong Margaret? I don't know. It's a complicated question because um, his mother, John's mother, was from Cynthia, Kentucky. And um, she was in a mixed race situation um, and she came north. So who knows what kind of white relatives uh, she had uh, along with black relatives in Cincinnati. And there was so much mixed race going on. And Douglas was very big about that, saying that the, the Southerners are gonna ruin the purity of the black race with all the mixed race people they're having. And so it's very hard to know. Uh, there, there weren't many really um, pure ancestries that you could be sure about. But as far as I know, he, he was not um, related to certainly the Gaines family in um, Richwood, but it would be possible. And I, I just haven't been able to follow, the, follow that out. All right. A little bit longer question from uh, Lee Person, but an interesting question. In explaining the pose used for the first Douglas statue erected in Rochester in 1899, sponsor John Thompson explains that sculptor Sidney Edwards portrayed Douglas, quote, as he stood before an audience in Cincinnati, Ohio, soon after the adoption of the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution and, quote, uttered these words, fellow citizens, I appear before you tonight for the first time in the more elevated position of an American citizen. Question, is there any evidence that Douglas spoke in Cincinnati in 1870? I don't know. I haven't seen that yet. I have 60, there, those four between 67 and 69. And then again in 76 and 88, there may have been others that I haven't been able to find yet, and there hasn't been a lot of research on this. That's what I'd love to know about that. So it could well be. A little research problem. Oh, yeah. He had a lot of connections here. Uh, you, uh, when you talked about uh, the Margaret Garner case and the previous case of the unknown, uh, uh, that prompted this question. Is, in collaborating with other scholars, have you found that the saving of children by their uh, parents from slavery by taking their lives, children's lives, was something that took place in other regions. You know, I don't know about that. I mean, the, the one thing that struck me in learning about that poor family in 48 is that Garner would have known about this. In other words, there was a precedent right here in Northern Kentucky for this. So it would not be uh, impossible. I know that uh, Nikki Taylor's written a good book on, on Margaret Garner, and she talks about this having happened with other mothers um, and their children. 
And um, there's uh, nonicide and infanticide, <laughs> depending on the, how many months old the child was. So it did happen, uh, but I don't know how widespread it was numerically or geographically. I would guess it probably happened on some occasions everywhere in very impossible situations. <clears throat> Another simple question before we get to a couple of hard ones. Uh, <laughs> when you read the uh, um, the death notice, the headline said Fred Douglas. Yeah. Lee, uh, just thinking <clears throat> actually Frederick Douglas. Did people call him Fred? Well, it's interesting. In in the forties, the Enquirer, when it was being very racist, called him Fred. So it was like a lack of respect. I I feel it was with intimate respect you know, in that obituary. So generally he was called Frederick. Um, certainly in print, he always went by Frederick. Um, but I think informally, some people called him Fred. But Frederick is the more common usage. Good eye, whoever noticed that. This question, did Douglas associate with the, associate with the liberal Germans, 1848 revolutionaries community in Cincinnati or because many of them were Catholic, did he not? Um, his relation to the German community became really strong in 54 because <clears throat> they were very upset about the Kansas Nebraska Act and they were huge supporters of that convention in 54 when he and Stone uh, were speaking. And they were also involved in, you know, moving out to Kansas and Nebraska. A lot of Germans continued moving out west. And I was surprised to find out how many ships uh, boats full of uh, people and even schoolrooms and uh, machinery were sent out from the Cincinnati Wharf uh, into Kansas through the rivers. There was just a huge movement going on here. So there began to be a lot of collaboration with the German community um, starting then. All right, uh, we have one final question. Okay. It's, uh, it's, uh... I think maybe a good one to end on, and from our colleague at NKU, Dale Ellicke. Uh, during our current time of awareness of racial inequity, still alive today, what can we learn from Douglas and his time in parallels? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, the courage to try to do what's needed to respect the humanity of others. And I think maybe in our times, when we're so polarized, uh, to always hope that opinions can change. Because right now, it looks like it's very hard for people on one side or the other uh, to honor or respect or see any future with the others. It certainly was that polarized in our country in 1850. Um, and uh, he and others kept hoping that, uh, you know, as he thought, even in the Inquirer, there couldn't be anything worse than how the Inquirer treated him. But he kept addressing not the people he agreed with, but the ones on the other side who were undecided. He felt that's what he had to do is convert those people. So I think today to try to find a way to build bridges, even with those you don't agree with or don't understand, could be helpful if we can pull it off. And I think we have to find a way to do that. And uh, so I guess that would probably be at the moment, the, the largest takeaway I'd have from this period and, and how he acted. Well, thank you. And I want to share uh, not a question, but a comment from our audience, extraordinary information, much appreciated. And we all joined, uh, everybody said, thank you. Well, thanks for the chance to be here. We enjoyed it. I uh, want to remind everybody we'll be back next Tuesday night. So hope to see you then. Tell your friends and thanks for being with us this evening.